Good evening. President Biden set to address Congress and the American people. The State of the Union. ABC News live coverage begins right now. This is an ABC News special. The State of the Union. When I came to office, the pandemic was raging. Our economy was reeling. But we acted together. Now, two years in, it's clearer than ever that our plans work. As tensions with China escalate over the spy balloon shot down and the war in Europe enters its second year. This is about freedom. Freedom for Ukraine. Freedom everywhere. With historic job growth and economic recovery. The strongest job growth in history, the lowest unemployment rate in 54 years, manufacturing rebounding at a faster rate, inflation coming down. Put simply, I would argue the Biden economic plan is working. But a looming showdown over the debt ceiling ahead. I will not let anyone use the full faith and credit of the United States as a bargaining chip. With a country reeling from mass shootings and police brutality, President Biden stands before a divided Congress and a polarized nation to deliver his vision of the next year. We're the United States of America. And nothing, 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 nothing is beyond our capacity. Now reporting from Washington, David Muir. Good evening tonight from the nation's capital. In just a few moments here, President Biden will deliver his second State of the Union address to the nation. Americans and the world watching as he prepares to enter the House chamber on Capitol Hill tonight. President Biden's address, of course, coming at a pivotal moment in his presidency. Now halfway through his first term and potentially eyeing a run for a second term in 2024, of course. The president has yet to declare whether he'll run again. And for the first time, he'll deliver this speech in the House chamber where Republicans are now in the majority, a slim majority, after the midterm election, Democrats, of course, holding on to control of the Senate, gaining on their slim majority there. Still a very divided country, and this president knows that. But this is always an opportunity for any president to set the course, to try to build support, to reach out to Democrats, Republicans, independents watching at home tonight, and, of course, watching right there in the chamber. Also in the chamber tonight, our senior congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott. Rachel, what have you witnessed so far? Well, David, I can tell you this is a dramatic change for President Biden because in just a few moments, the president will be confronted with his new reality over the next two years, which is a divided government. And tonight, that is on full display already. As members were packing into the chamber, very little talk across the aisle between House Democrats and House Republicans, a sign of just how divisive our politics have become. And near the aisle, the president will be passing some of his Conscious Republican critics, Congressman Matt Gates, Congresswoman Lauren Boebert, and of course, all eyes tonight on the man sitting behind the president, the new Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy. Few words being exchanged right now between McCarthy and Vice President Kamala Harris, but McCarthy says tonight, not only will his party be watching, but the rest of the nation will be watching very closely, David. Rachel, thank you. We await William McFarland, of course, the newly appointed House Sergeant in Arms, who announced the president, appointed just a couple of weeks ago. Mr. Speaker, the President of the United States. And there he is with his second State of the Union, President Biden. The applause from the First Lady, Dr. Jill Biden. Of course, she has guests there tonight, which we'll get into over the course of the evening here. And as is always tradition, the President walking down that center aisle, shaking hands. With members from both parties, members of his cabinet are already in the chamber, of course. So are several justices from the Supreme Court, and we took note that a couple of retired justices, which we haven't seen in recent times. The president, it's believed, will make the case tonight with Americans watching at home with optimism about what's coming. He'll certainly note the administration's accomplishments, uh, bipartisan achievements, infrastructure, roads, bridges, making microchips in America, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, included in that the cap on insulin. And Mary Bruce is expected to make this case knowing full well that many Americans say they're simply not feeling this yet. David, I'm told the phrase we are going to hear over and over again tonight is finish the job. The president is going to argue that the economy is strong and that his policies are working. He's going to point to that shockingly strong jobs report, tout many of his accomplishments, including that bipartisan infrastructure bill, and argue that his policies are really improving the lives of Americans. But as you say, we know so many Americans really aren't feeling that. They don't agree with that. And he is going to speak to them directly and say, I get it. He understands their pain and is going to ask them essentially to trust him and argue the the country is headed in the right direction. To stay the course. A standing uh, behind the president tonight, the vice president, Kamala Harris, where we usually see her, of course, during the State of the Unions. But beside her, someone new, not new to the Capitol, of course, not new to the country, but new to this role, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. There they are. 
standing side by side for the first time. We have been watching them over the course of the evening. Obviously different parties, but uh, sort of the lip reading has already begun. Word they said to each other, this is a packed house tonight. We didn't see them discussing any in-depth policy, at least not yet. We'll stay on that. Both the president and Speaker McCarthy signaling respect for one another in recent days. They did just meet at the White House, signaling it was constructive, a start in this looming debate over the debt ceiling. Uh, the president will likely tonight, as Mary just said, point to these historic jobs numbers, 12 million jobs since he took office, 800,000 manufacturing jobs, uh, unemployment now at its lowest point since 1969. Uh, slowing inflation, but still inflation. And again, Americans are feeling this. They're seeing it every day at the grocery store, the gas station. And John Carl, uh, President Biden's message tonight, finish the job, in, in many ways echoes another president. He's going to echo a president who almost exactly 40 years ago came into this chamber with approval ratings even lower than Biden's are now, an economy covering from high inflation, high interest rates, somebody who people said was too old. That president was Ronald Reagan, 1983, uh, he said, stay the course, almost an exact echo of finish the job. And he won re-election the next year by one of the biggest landslides in American history. Yeah. Now, that's what Biden would like to emulate. <laughs> really interesting. Finish the job from President Biden tonight, as John points out. We were looking at the vintage political button from the Reagan years, stay the course. Stay the course. That was the campaign slogan for Reagan going into 1984. We're watching the president as he says hello to the justices who've gathered there. And John, you and I were noting that there were a couple of retired justices here, which we don't often see. I haven't seen this uh, in all my time covering State of the Union address to see, uh, you know, justice. There are four justices there, but you have retired Justice Anthony Kennedy, and you also have a retired Justice Stephen Breyer. I think it's a message from the retired justices that they don't want to see the Supreme Court uh, fall into the same partisan divide uh, that the rest of the country and the rest of the government has fallen into. Martha Raddatz, uh, we saw Speaker Nancy Pelosi, the former speaker, in a different place in the chamber tonight. Must feel very different for her as she watches uh, the person who has followed in her footsteps, Kevin McCarthy, after that battle. But right now, the president uh, meeting the Joint Chiefs and the military establishment, the defense secretary as well, and foreign policy will play a major role tonight. It, it will, but I, I want to think back to last year. The president spent 12 minutes talking about Ukraine. It was less than a week after Russia invaded. There was some debate within the administration on how much to focus on Ukraine. They decided they have to do that. The president really wants to rally support for Ukraine, and the administration feels it's waning just a bit. The president shaking Speaker McCarthy's hand. Standing behind the president for the State of the Union for the first time. Of course, again, the first lady in the chamber as well, and along with her, the guests who have assembled there tonight. Lindsay Davis is going to have more on the family that is joining the First Lady. And we're expecting to hear from the Speaker. And there's the President, ready to address the country. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Members of Congress, I have the high privilege and the distinct honor to present to you the President of the United States. His first time doing that. Speaker McCarthy had some reporters at his office today, off the record, but did say we could acknowledge the meeting and signaling John Carl his respect, at least at the start. McCarthy wants to say that he respects the president and that the president respects him. Thank you. Please. Let's listen to the president. Mr. Speaker, Madam Vice President, our first lady and second gentleman, good to see you guys up there. <laughs> Members of Congress. <laughs> By the way, Chief Justice, I may need a court order. She gets to go to the, the game tomorrow, uh, next week. I have to stay home. <laughs> Got to work something out here. Members of the cabinet, leaders of our military, Chief Justice, Associate Justice, and retired Justice of the Supreme Court, and to you, my fellow Americans. You know, uh, I start tonight by congratulating the 118th Congress and the new Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy.
Speaker, I don't want to ruin your reputation, but I look forward to working with you. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to congratulate the new leader of the House Democrats, the first African-American minority leader in history, Hakeem Jeffries. <laughs> He won in spite of the fact I campaigned for him. <laughs> Congratulations to the longest serving leader in the history of the United States Senate, Mitch McConnell. Where are you, Mitch? <laughs> and congratulations to Chuck Schumer. Another, uh, you know, another term as Senate Minority Leader. Uh, you know, I think you. Uh, only this time you have a slightly bigger majority, Mr. Leader, and you're the majority leader. About that much bigger? Yeah. Well, I tell you what. I want to give special recognition to someone who I think is going to be considered the greatest speaker in the history of the House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi. The story of America is a story of progress and resilience, of always moving forward, of never, ever giving up. It's a story unique among all nations. We're the only country that has emerged from every crisis we've ever entered stronger than we got into it. Look, folks, th that's what we're doing again. Two years ago, the economy was reeling. I stand here tonight after we've created, with the help of many people in this room, 12 million new jobs, more jobs created in two years than any president's created in four years because of you all, because of the American people. Two years ago, and two years ago, COVID had shut down, our businesses were closed, our schools were robbed of so much, and today, COVID no longer controls our lives. And two years ago, democracy faced its greatest threats in the Civil War. And today, though bruised, our democracy remains unbowed and unbroken. As we gather here tonight, we're writing the next chapter in the great American story, a story of progress and resilience. When world leaders ask me to define America, and they do, believe it or not, I say I can define it in one word, and I mean this, possibilities. We don't think anything is beyond our capacity. Everything is a possibility. You know, we're often told that Democrats and Republicans can't work together. But over the past two years, we've proved the cynics and naysayers wrong. Yes, we disagreed plenty. And yes, there were times when Democrats went alone. But time and again, Democrats and Republicans came together, came together to defend a stronger and safer Europe. You came together to pass one in a, gen one in a generation, once in a generation infrastructure law, building bridges connecting our nation and our people. We came together to pass the most significant law ever, helping victims expose the toxic burn pits. And in fact, It's important. And in fact, I signed over 300 bipartisan pieces of legislation since becoming president, from reauthorizing the Violence Against Women Act, the Electoral Count Reform Act, the Respect for Marriage Act that protects the right to marry the person you love. And to my Republican friends, if we could work together the last Congress, there's no reason we can't work together and find consensus on important things in this Congress as well. I think... Folks... You all are as formed as I am, but I think the people sent us a clear message. Fighting for the sake of fighting, Power for the sake of power, conflict for the sake of conflict gets us nowhere. 
That's always been my vision of our country, and I know it's many of yours, to restore the soul of this nation, to rebuild the backbone of America, America's middle class, and to unite the country. We've been sent here to finish the job, in my view. For decades, the middle class has been hollowed out in more than, and not no one administration, but for a long time. Too many good-paying manufacturing jobs move overseas. Factories closed down. Once thriving cities and towns that many of you represent became shadows of what they used to be. And along the way, something else we lost. Pride, our sense of self-worth. I ran for president to fundamentally change things, to make sure our economy works for everyone, so we can all feel that pride in what we do. To build an economy from the bottom up and the middle out, not from the top down. Because when the middle class does well, the poor have a ladder up, and the wealthy still do very well. We all do well. I know a lot of you always kid me for always quoting my dad, but my dad used to say, Joey, a job's about a lot more than a paycheck. He really would say this. It's about a lot more than a paycheck. It's about your dignity. It's about respect. It's about being able to look your kid in the eye and say, honey, it's going to be okay and mean it. Well, folks, so let's look at the results. We're not finished yet by any stretch of the imagination, but unemployment rate is at 3.4%, a 50-year low. A near record. A near record unemployment. near record unemployment for black and Hispanic workers. We've already created, your help, 800,000 good paying manufacturing jobs, the fastest growth in 40 years. <laughs> and where is it written? Where is it written that America can't lead the world in manufacturing? And I don't know where that's written. For too many decades, we imported projects and exported jobs. Now, thanks to what you've all done, we're exporting American products and creating American jobs. <laughs> Folks, inflation, inflation has been a global problem because the pandemic disrupted our supply chains and Putin's unfair and brutal war in Ukraine disrupted ener energy supplies as well as food supplies, blocking all that grain in Ukraine. But we're better positioned than any country on Earth right now. But we have more to do. But here at home, inflation is coming down. Here at home, gas prices are down $1.50 from their peak. Food inflation is coming down. Not fast enough, but coming down. Inflation has fallen every month for the last six months, while take-home pay has gone up. Additionally, over the last two years, a record 10 million Americans applied to start new businesses. 10 million. And by the way, every time, every time someone starts a small business as an act of hope, and Madam Vice President, I want to thank you for leading that effort to ensure the small businesses have access to capital and the historic laws we enacted that are going to just come into being. Standing here last year, I shared with you a story of American genius and possibilities semiconductors, small computer chips the size of a fingerprint that power everything, from cell phones to automobiles and so much more. These chips were invented in America. Let's get that straight. They were invented in America. We used to make 40 percent of the world's chips. In the last several decades, we lost our edge. We're down to only producing 10 percent. We all saw what happened during the pandemic when chip factories shut down overseas. Today's automobiles need 3,000 chips, each of those automobiles. But American automobiles couldn't make enough cars because there weren't enough chips. Car prices went up. People got laid off. So did everything from refrigerators to cell phones. We can never let that happen again. That's why, that's why we came together to pass the Bipartisan Chips and Science Act. I know I've been criticized for saying this, but I'm not changing my view. 
We're going to make sure the supply chain for America begins in America. The supply chain begins in America. We've already created. We've already created. 800,000 new manufacturing jobs without this law, before the law get, k kicks in. With this new law, we're going to create hundreds of thousands of new jobs across the country. And I mean all across the country, throughout not just the coast, but through the middle of the country as well. That's going to come from companies that have announced more than $300 billion in investment in American manufacturing over the next few years. Outside of Columbus, Ohio, Intel is building semiconductor factories on a thousand acres, literally a field of dreams. It's going to create 10,000 jobs, that one investment, 7,000 construction jobs, 3,000 jobs in those factories once they're finished. They call them factories. Jobs paying an average of $130,000 a year, and many do not require a college degree. Jobs. Because we work together, these jobs are people don't have to leave home to search for opportunity. It's just getting started. Think about the new homes, the small businesses, the big, the medium-sized businesses. So much more that's going to be needed to support those 3,000 those 3, permanent jobs and the factories that are going to be built. Talk to mayors and governors, Democrats and Republicans. And they'll tell you what this means for their communities. We're seeing these field of dreams transform to the heartland. But to maintain the strongest economy in the world, we need the best infrastructure in the world. And folks, as you all know, we used to be number one in the world in infrastructure. We've sunk to 13th in the world. The United States of America, 13th in the world in infrastructure, modern infrastructure. But now we're coming back because we came together and passed the bipartisan infrastructure law, the largest investment in infrastructure since President Eisenhower's interstate highway system. And folks, already we've, we've funded over 20,000 projects including major airports from Boston to Atlanta to Portland. Projects that are going to put thousands of people to work rebuilding our highways, our bridges, our railroads, our tunnels, ports, airports, clean water, high-speed internet, all across America. Urban, rural, tribal. And folks, we're just getting started. We're just getting started. And I mean it sincerely. I want to thank my Republican friends who voted for the law and my Republican friends who voted against it as well. But I'm still, I, I still get asked to fund the projects in those districts as well. But don't worry. I promised I'd be a president for all Americans. We'll fund these projects. And I'll see you at the groundbreaking. Look. This law. This law will further unite all of America. Projects like Brent Spent Bridge in Kentucky over the Ohio River, built 60 years ago, badly needed repairs, one of the nation's most congested freight routes, carrying $2 billion worth of freight every single day across the Ohio River. And folks, I've been talking about fixing it for decades, but we're really finally going to get it done. Yes. I went there last month with Democrats and Republicans and from both states to deliver a commitment of $1.6 billion for this project. And while I was there, I met a young woman named Sarah, who's here tonight. I don't know where Sarah is. Is she up in the box? I don't know. Sarah, how are you? Well, Sarah, for 30 years, for 30 years, I learned, she told me she'd been a proud member of the Iron Workers Local 44, known as... <laughs> known as the Cowboys in the Sky. The folks who built, 
built Cincinnati skyline. Sarah said she can't wait to be 10 stories above the Ohio River building that new bridge. God bless her. <laughs> that's pride. And that's what we're also building. We're building back pride. Look, we're also replacing poisonous lead pipes that go into 10 million homes in America. 400,000 school and child care centers. So every child in America, every child in America can drink the water instead of having permanent damage to their brain. Look, we're making sure, <clears throat> we're making sure that every community, every community in America has access to affordable high-speed internet. No parent should have to drive by McDonald's parking lot to help them do their homework online with their kids, which many thousands were doing across the country. And when we do these projects, and again, I get criticized for this, but I make no excuses for it, we're going to buy American. We're going to buy American. <laughs> Folks. And it's totally, it's totally consistent with international trade rules. Buy America has been the law since 1933, but for too long, past administrations, Democrat and Republican, have fought to get around it. Not anymore. Tonight, I'm announcing new standards require all construction materials used in federal infrastructure projects to be made in America. <laughs> made in America. I mean it. Lumber. Glass, drywall, fiber optic cable. And on my watch, American roads, bridges, and American highways are going to be made with American products as well. Folks, my economic plan is about investing in places and people that have been forgotten. So many of you listen to me tonight. I know you feel it. So many of you felt like you've just simply been forgotten. Amid the economic upheaval of the past four decades, too many people have been left behind and treat it like they're invisible. Maybe that's you watching from home. Remember the jobs that went away. You remember them, don't you? The folks at home remember them. You wonder whether the path even exists anymore for your children to get ahead without having to move away. Well, that's why I get that. That's why we're building an economy where no one's left behind. Jobs are coming back. Pride is coming back because choices we made in the last several years. You know, this is my view of blue collar blueprint to rebuild America and make a real difference in your lives at home. For example, too many of you lay in bed at night like my dad did, staring at the ceiling, wondering what in God's name happens if, this, if your spouse gets cancer or your child gets deadly ill, or something happens to you, what are you going to have? Are you have money to pay for those medical bills? Are you going to have to sell the house or try to get a second mortgage on it? I get it. I get it. With the Inflation Reduction Act that I signed into law, we're taking on powerful interest to bring health care costs down so you can sleep better at night with more security. You know, we pay more for prescription drugs than any nation in the world. Let me say it again. We pay more for prescription drugs than any major nation on Earth. For example, one in 10 Americans has diabetes. Many of you in this chamber do, and in the audience. But every day, millions need insulin to control their diabetes so they can literally stay alive. Insulin's been around for over 100 years. The guy who invented it didn't even patent it because he wanted it to be available for everyone. It cost the drug companies roughly $10 a vial to make that insulin. Packaging and all, you may get up to $13. But Big Pharma has been unfairly charging people hundreds of dollars, four to five hundred dollars a month, making record profits. Not anymore. <laughs> Not anymore. <clears throat> So 
government. So many things that we did are only now coming to fruition. We said we were doing this, and we said we passed the law to do it, but people didn't know because the law didn't take effect until January 1 of this year. We capped the cost of insulin at $35 a month for seniors on Medicaid. The people are just finding out. I'm sure you're getting the same calls I'm getting. Look, there are millions of other Americans who do not or are not on Medicare, including 200,000 young people with type 1 diabetes who need this insulin to stay alive. Let's finish the job this time. Let's cap the cost of insulin for everybody at $35. Folks, the big farmers still going to do very well, I promise you all. I promise you they're going to do very well. This law, so, this law also caps and won't even go into effect until 2025. Costs, out-of-pocket drug costs for seniors on Medicare at a maximum of $2,000 a year. You don't have to pay more than $2,000 a year, no matter how much your drug costs are. Because you know why? You all know it. Many of you, like many in my family, have cancer. You know the drugs can range from $10,000, $11,000, $14,000, $15,000 for the cancer drugs. If drug prices rise faster than inflation, drug companies are going to have to pay Medicare back the difference. We're finally, we're finally giving Medicare the power to negotiate drug prices. Bringing down, bringing down prescription drug costs doesn't just save seniors money, it cuts the federal deficit by billions of dollars by hundreds of billions of dollars. Because these prescription drugs are drugs purchased by Medicare to make, keep their commitment to the seniors. Well, guess what? Instead of paying four or 500 bucks a month, you're paying 15. That's a lot of savings for the federal government. And by the way, why wouldn't we want that? Now, some members here are threatening, and I know it's not an official party position, so. I'm not I'm going to exaggerate, but threatening to repeal the Inflation Reduction Act. As my coach, that's okay, that's fair. As my football coach used to say, lots of luck in your senior year. <laughs> Make no mistake, if you try anything to raise the cost of presenting jobs, I will veto it. to say the more Americans have health insurance now than ever in history. A record 16 million people are enrolled in the Affordable Care Act. And thanks, thanks to the law I signed last year, saving millions are saving $800 a year on their premiums. And by the way, that law was written and the benefit expires in 2025. So my plea to some of you, at least in this audience, Let's finish the job and make these savings permanent. Expand coverage on Medicaid. Look, the Inflation Reduction Act is also the most significant investment ever in climate change. Ever. Lower utility bill, creating American jobs, leading the world to a clean energy future. I visited the devastating aftermath of record floods, droughts, storms, and wildfires from Arizona to Mexico to all the way up to the Canadian border. More timber has been burned, as I've observed from helicopters, than the entire state of Missouri. And we don't have global warming? Not a problem. In addition to emergency recovery from Puerto Rico to Florida to Idaho, we're rebuilding for the long term. New electric grids that are able to weather major storms and not prevent those fire, forest fires. Roads and water systems will stand the next big flood. Clean energy to cut pollution and create jobs in communities often left behind. 
We're going to build 500,000 electric vehicle charging stations installed across the country by tens of thousands of IBW workers. And we're helping families save more than $1,000 a year with tax credits to purchase electric vehicles and efficient, and efficient appliances, energy efficient appliances. Historic conservation efforts to be responsible stewards of our land. Let's face reality. The climate crisis doesn't care if you're in a red or blue state. It's an existential threat. We have an obligation, not to ourselves, but to our children and grandchildren to confront it. I'm proud of how, the, how America at last is stepping up to the challenge. We're still going to need oil and gas for a while. But guess what? No, we do. But there's so much more to do. We got to finish the job. And we pay for these investments in our future by finally making the wealthiest and biggest corporations begin to pay their fair share. Just begin. Look, I'm a capitalist. I'm a capitalist, but pay your fair share. I think a lot of you at home, a lot of you at home agree with me and many people that you know the tax system is not fair. It is not fair. Look, the idea that in 2020, 55 of the largest corporations in America, the Fortune 500, made $40 billion in profits and paid zero in federal taxes? Zero? Folks, it's simply not fair. But now, because of the law I signed, billion-dollar companies have to pay a minimum of 15 percent. God love them. 15 percent. That's less than a nurse pays. Let me be crystal clear. I said at the very beginning, under my plans, as long as I'm president, nobody earning less than $400,000 will pay an additional penny in taxes. Nobody, not one penny. But let's finish the job. There's more to do. We have to reward work, not just wealth. Pass my proposal for the billionaire minimum tax. You know, there's a thousand billionaires in America. It's up from about 600 in the beginning of the term. But no billionaire should be paying a lower tax rate than a school teacher or firefighter. Well, I mean it. Think about it. I mean, look. I know you aren't enthusiastic about that, but think about it. Think about it. Have you noticed Big Oil just reported his profits, record profits? Last year, they made $200 billion in the midst of a global energy crisis. I think it's outrageous. Why? They invested too little of that profit to increase domestic production. And when I talk to a couple of them, they say, well, we're afraid you're going to shut down all the oil wells and all the uh, oil refineries anyway, so why should we invest in them? I said, we're going to need oil for at least another decade, and that's going to exceed <laughs> And beyond that, we're going to need it. Production. If they had, in fact, invested in the production to keep gas prices down, instead, they used the record profits to buy back their own stock, rewarding their CEOs and shareholders. Corporations ought to do the right thing. That's why I propose we quadruple the tax on corporate stock buybacks and encourage long, long-term investments. They'll still make considerable profit. Let's finish the job and close the loopholes that allow very wealthy to avoid paying their taxes. Instead of cutting the number of audits for wealthy taxpayers, I just signed a law to reduce the deficit by $114 billion by cracking down on wealthy tax cheats. That's being fiscally responsible. In the last two years, my administration has cut the deficit by more than $1.7 trillion. 
the largest deficit reduction in American history. <laughs> Under the previous administration, the American deficit went up four years in a row. Because those record deficits, no president added more to the national debt in any four years than my predecessor. Nearly 25 percent of the entire national debt that took over 200 years to accumulate was added by just one administration alone, the last one. They're the facts. Check it out. Check it out. How did Congress respond to that debt? They did the right thing. They lifted the debt ceiling three times without preconditions or crisis. They paid American bills to prevent an economic disaster in the country. So tonight, I'm asking the Congress to follow suit. Let's commit here tonight to the full faith and credit of the United States of America will never, ever be questioned. So my many of, some of my Republican friends want to take the economy hostage. I get it, unless I agree to their economic plans. All of you at home should know what those plans are. Instead of making the wealthy pay their fair share, some Republicans, some Republicans want Medicare and Social Security to sunset. I'm not saying it's a majority. Let me give you, anybody who doubts it, contact my office. I'll give you a copy. I'll give you a copy of the proposal. That means Congress doesn't vote. Well, I'm glad to see you. No, I tell you, I, I enjoy conversion. You know, it means if, if Congress doesn't keep the programs the way they are, they'd go away. Other Republicans say, I'm not saying it's a majority of you. I don't even think it's even a significant. But it's being proposed by individuals. I'm not politely not naming them, but it's being proposed by some of you. Look, folks. The idea is that we're not going to be we're, we're not going to be moved into being threatened to default on the debt if we don't respond, <laughs> folks. So, folks, as we all apparently agree. Social Security and Medicare is off the, off the books now, right? They're not to be sponsored. All right. We got unanimity. Social Security and Medicare are a lifeline for millions of seniors. Americans have to pay into them from the very first paycheck they started. So tonight, let's all agree, and apparently we are, let's stand up for seniors. Stand up and show them. We'll not cut Social Security. We will not cut Medicare. Those benefits belong to the American people. They earned it. And if anyone tries to cut Social Security, which apparently no one's going to do, and if anyone tries to cut Medicare, I'll stop them. I'll veto it. And look, I'm not going to allow them to take away, be taken away. Not today, not tomorrow, not ever. But apparently, it's not going to be a problem. Next month, when I offer my fiscal plan, I ask my Republican friends to lay down their plan as well. I really mean it. Let's sit down together and discuss our mutual plans together. Let's do that. I can tell you, the plan I'm going to show you is going to cut the deficit by another $2 trillion. And it won't cut a single bit of Medicare or Social Security. In fact, we're going to extend the Medicare Trust Fund at least two decades, because that's going to be the next argument. How do we make keep it solvent, right? Well, we'll not raise tax on anyone making under 400 grand, but we'll pay for it the way we talked about tonight by making sure that the wealthy and big corporations pay their fair share. Look, look, look. Here, here's the deal. They aren't just taking advantage of the tax code. They're taking advantage of you, the American consumer. Here's my message to all of you out there. I have your back. We're already preventing Americans from receiving surprise medical bills, stopping $1 billion surprise bills per month so far. We're protecting 
seniors' life savings by cracking down on nursing homes that commit fraud, endanger patient safety, prescribe drugs that are not needed. Millions of Americans can now save thousands of dollars because they can finally get a hearing aid over the counter without a prescription. Look, capitalism without competition is not capitalism. It's extortion. It's exploitation. Last year, I cracked down, with the help of many of you, on foreign shipping companies that were making you pay higher prices for every good coming into the country. I signed a bipartisan bill that cut shipping costs by 90 percent, helping American farmers, businessmen, and consumers. Let's finish the job. Pass the bipartisan legislation to strengthen, to strengthen antitrust enforcement and, for big, and prevent big online platforms from giving their own products an unfair advantage. My administration is also taking on junk fees, those hidden surcharges too many companies use to make you pay more. For example, we're making airlines show you the full ticket price up front, refund your money if your flight is canceled or delayed. We reduce exorbitant bank overdrafts by saving consumers more than $1 billion a year. We're cutting credit card late fees by 75 percent, from $30 to $8. Look, junk fees may not matter to the very wealthy, but they matter to most other folks in homes like the one I grew up in, like many of you did. They add up to hundreds of dollars a month. They make it harder for you to pay your bills or afford that family trip. I know how unfair it feels when a company overcharges you and gets away with it. Not anymore. We've written a bill to stop it all. It's called the Junk Fee Prevention Act. We're going to ban surprise resort fees that hotels charge on your bill. Those fees can cost you up to $90 a night at hotels that aren't even resorts. <laughs> we, the idea that cable, internet, and cell phone companies can charge you 200 or more if you decide to switch to another provider. Give me a break. We can stop service fees on tickets to concerts and sporting events and make companies disclose all the fees up front. And we'll prohibit airlines from charging $50 round trip for family just to be able to sit together. Baggage fees are bad enough. Airlines can't treat your child like a piece of baggage. Americans are tired of being. We're tired of being played for suckers. So pass. Pass the Junk Free Prevention Act so companies stop ripping us off. For too long, workers have been getting stiffed, but not anymore. We're, getting, we're beginning to restore the dignity of work. For example, I, I, I should have known this, but I didn't until two years ago. 30 million workers have to sign non-compete agreements with the jobs they take. 30 million. So a cashier at a burger place can't walk across town and take the same job at another burger place and make a few bucks more. It just changed. But they just changed it because we exposed it. That was part of the deal, guys. Look it up. But not anymore. We're banning those agreements so companies have to compete for workers and pay them what they're worth. I must tell you, this is bound to get a response from my friends on my left with the right. I'm so sick and tired of companies breaking the law by preventing workers from organizing. Pass the PRO Act, because business have a right, workers have a right to form a union. And let's guarantee all workers have a living wage. Let's make sure working parents can afford to raise a family with sick days, paid family medical leave, affordable child care. That's going to enable millions of more people to go and stay at work. And let's restore the full child tax credit, which gave tens of millions of parents some breathing room and cut child poverty in half to the lowest level in history. And by the way, when we do all these things, we increase productivity. 
We increase economic growth. So let's finish the job and get more families access to affordable, quality housing. Let's get seniors who want to stay in their homes the care they need to do so. Let's give more breathing room to millions of family caregivers looking after their loved ones. Pass my plan so we get seniors and people with disabilities the home care and services they need. And support the workers who are doing God's work. These plans are fully paid for and we can afford to do them. Restoring the dignity of work means making education an affordable ticket to the middle class. You know, when we made public education, 12 years of it universal in the last century, we made the best educated, best paid, we became the best educated, best paid nation in the world. But the rest of the world's caught up. It's caught up. Jill, my wife, who teaches full time, has an expression. I hope I get it right, kid. Any nation that out educates us is going to outcompete us. Any nation out educates is going to outcompete us. Folks, we all know 12 years of education is not enough to win the economic competition of 21st century. <laughs> we want to have the best educated workforce. Let's finish the job by providing access to preschool for three and four years old. Studies show that children who go to preschool are nearly 50 percent more likely to finish high school and go on to earn a two or four year degree, no matter their background they came from. Let's give public school teachers a raise. We're making progress by reducing student debt, increasing Pell Grants for working and middle class families. Let's finish the job and connect students to career opportunities starting in high school. Provide access to two years of community college, the best career training in America, in addition to being a pathway to a four year degree. Let's offer every American a path to a good career, whether they go to college or not. And folks, folks, in the midst of the COVID crisis, when schools were closed and we were shutting down everything, Let's recognize how far we came in the fight against the pandemic itself. While the virus is not gone, thanks to the resilience of the American people and the ingenuity of medicine, we've broken the COVID grip on us. COVID deaths are down by 90 percent. We've saved millions of lives and opened up our country. We opened our country back up. And soon we'll end the public health emergency. But. That's called a public health emergency. But we'll remember the toll and pain that's never going to go away. More than a million Americans lost their lives to COVID. A million. Families grieving, children orphaned, empty chairs at the dining room table constantly reminding you that she used to sit there. Remembering them, we remain vigilant. We still need to monitor dozens of variants and support new vaccines and treatments. So Congress needs to fund these efforts and keep America safe. And as we emerge from this crisis stronger, we're also got to double down on prosecuting criminals who stole relief money meant to keep workers and small businesses afloat. Before I came to office, you remember, during that campaign, the big issue was about inspector generals who would protect taxpayers' dollars who were sidelined. They were fired. Many people said, we don't need them. And fraud became rampant. Last year, I told you the watchdogs are back. Since then, since then, we've recovered billions of taxpayers' dollars. Now let's triple the anti-fraud strike force going after these criminals, double the statute of limitations on these crimes, and crack down on identity fraud by criminal syndicates stealing billions of dollars, billions of dollars from the American people. And the data shows that for every dollar we put into fighting fraud, the tax rates get back at least 10 times as much. It matters.
It matters. Look, COVID left its scars, like the spike in violent crime in 2020, the first year of the pandemic. We have an obligation to make sure all people are safe. Public safety depends on public trust, as all of us know. But too often, that trust is violated. Join us tonight are the parents of Tyree Nichols. Welcome. We had to bury Tyree last week. As many of you personally know, there's no word to describe the heartache or grief of losing a child. But imagine, imagine if you lost that child at the hands of the law. Imagine having to worry whether your son or daughter came home from walking down the street, or playing in the park, or just driving a car. Most of us in here have never had to have the talk, the talk that brown and black parents have had to have with their children. Bo, Hunter, Ashley, my children. I never had to have the talk with them. I never had to tell them if a police officer pulls you over, turn your interior lights on right away. Don't reach for your license. Keep your hands on the steering wheel. Imagine having to worry like that every single time your kid got in a car. Here's what Tyree's mother shared with me when I spoke to her, when I asked her how she finds the courage to carry on and speak out. With the faith of God, she said her son was, quote, a beautiful soul, and something good will come of this. Imagine how much courage and carry that takes. It's up to us, to all of us. We all want the same thing, neighborhoods free of violence, law enforcement of enforcement who earns the community's trust. Just as every cop, when they pin on that badge in the morning, has a right to be able to go home at night, so does everybody else out there. Our children have a right to come home safely. Equal protection under the law is a covenant we have with each other in America. We know police officers put their lives on the line every single night and day. And we know we ask them in many cases to do too much to be counselors, social workers, psychologists, responding to drug overdoses, mental health crises, and so much more. In one sense, we ask much too much of them. I know most cops and their families are good, decent, honorable people, the vast majority. But they risk. And they risk their lives every time they put that shield on. But what happened to Tyree in Memphis happens too often. We have to do better. Give law enforcement the real training they need. Hold them to higher standards. Help them succeed in keeping us safe. We also need more first responders and professionals to address the growing mental health substance abuse challenges. More resources to reduce violent crime and gun crime. More community intervention programs. More investment in housing, education, and job training. All this can help prevent violence in the first place. And when police officers or police departments violate the public trust, they must be held accountable. With the support. With the support of the families of victims, civil rights groups, and law enforcement, I signed an executive order for all federal officers banning chokeholds, restricting no-knock warrants, and other key elements of the George Floyd Act. Let's commit ourselves to make the words of Tyler's mom true. Something good must come from this. Something good. <laughs> and all of us, all of us, <laughs> we 
Folks, it's difficult, but it's simple. All of us in, the cha in this chamber, we need to rise to this moment. We can't turn away. Let's do what we know in our hearts that we need to do. Let's come together to finish the job on police reform. Do something. Do something. That was the plea of parents who lost their children in Uvalde. I met with every one of them. Do something about gun violence. Thank God. Thank God we did. Passing the most sweeping gun safety law in three decades. That includes things like that the majority of responsible gun owners already support enhanced background checks for 18 to 21 years old, red flag laws keeping guns out of the hands of people who are a danger to themselves and others. But we know our work is not done. Join us tonight is Brandon Say, a 26-year-old hero. Brandon put his college dreams on hold to be at his mom's side. His mom's side when she was dying from cancer. And Brandon... Brandon now works at the dance studio started by his grandparents. And two weeks ago, during the Lunar New Year celebrations, he heard the studio door close, and he saw a man standing there pointing a semi-automatic pistol at him. He thought he was going to die, but he thought about the people inside. And in that instant, he found the courage to act and wrestle the semi-automatic pistol away from the gunman who had already killed 11 people in another dance studio. 11. He saved lives. It's time we do the same. Ban assault weapons now. Ban them now. Once and for all. I led the fight to do that in 1994. And in, in 10 years, that ban was law. Mass shootings went down. After we let it expire in the Republican administration, mass shootings tripled. Let's finish the job and ban these assault weapons. And let's also come together on immigration. Make it a bipartisan issue once again. We know we now have a record number of personnel working to secure the border, arresting 8,000 human smugglers, seizing over 23,000 pounds of fentanyl in just the last several months. We've launched a new border plan last month. Unlawful migration from Cuba, Haiti, Nicaragua, and Venezuela has come down 97 percent as a consequence of that. But American border problems won't be fixed until Congress acts. If we don't pass my comprehensive immigration reform, at least pass my plan to provide the equipment and officers to secure the border. And a pathway to citizenship for dreamers those on temporary status, farm workers, essential workers. Here in the People's House, it's our duty to protect all the people's rights and freedoms. Congress must restore the right and the... Congress must restore the right that was taken away in Roe v. Wade and protect Roe v. Wade. Give every woman a constant right. The Vice President and I are doing everything to protect access to reproductive health care and safeguard patient safety. But already, more than a dozen states are enforcing extreme abortion bans. Make no mistake about it. If Congress passes a national ban, I will veto it. But let's also pass. Let's also pass the Bipartisan Equality Act to ensure LBG, LGBTQ Americans, especially transgender young people, can live with safety and dignity. Our strength... Our strength is not just the example of our power, but the power of our example. Let's remember the world's watching. I spoke from this chamber one year ago just days after Vladimir Putin unleashed his brutal attack against Ukraine. 
a murderous assault, evoking images of death and destruction Europe suffered in World War II. Putin's invasion has been a test for the ages, a test for America, a test for the world. Would we stand for the most basic of principles? Would we stand for sovereignty? We stand for the right of people to live free of tyranny? Will we stand for the defense of democracy? For such defense matters to us because it keeps peace and prevents open season on would-be aggressors and threatens our prosperity. One year later, we know the answer. Yes, we would, and we did. We did. And together, we did what America always does at our best. We led. We united NATO. We built a global coalition. We stood against Putin's aggression. We stood with the Ukrainian people to tonight. We're once again joined by Ukrainian's ambassador to the United States. She represents not her, just her nation, but the courage of her people. Ambassador, is, our ambassador is here. United, we're in uniting our support of your country. Will you stand so we can all take a look at you? Thank you. Because we're going to stand with you as long as it takes. Our nation is working for more freedom, more dignity, more, more peace not just in Europe, but everywhere. Before I came to office, the story was about how the Re People's Republic of China was increasing its power and America was failing in the world. Not anymore. We made clear, and I made clear in my personal conversations, which have been many, with President Xi, that we seek competition, not conflict. But I will make no apologies that we're investing in, to make America stronger. Investing in American innovation and industries will define the future that China intends to be dominated. Investing in our alliances and working with our allies to protect advanced technologies so they will not be used against us. Modernizing our military to safeguard stability and determine, to, to deter aggression. Today, we're in the strongest position in decades to compete with China or anyone else in the world. Anyone else in the world. And I'm committed. <clears throat> I'm committed to work with China where we can advance American interests and benefit the world. But make no mistake about it, as we made clear last week, if China threatens our sovereignty, we will act to protect our country, and we did. Look, let's be clear. Winning the competition should unite all of us. We face serious challenges across the world. But in the past two years, democracies have become stronger, not weaker. Autocracy has grown weaker, not stronger. Name me a world leader who changed places with Xi Jinping. Name me one. Name me one. America's rallying the world to meet those challenges from climate to global health, to food insecurity, to terrorism, to territorial aggression. Allies are stepping up, spending more and doing more. Look. The bridges were forming between partners in the Pacific and those in the Atlantic. And those who bet against America are learning how wrong they are. It's never, ever been a good bet to bet against America. Never. Office most assured that bipartisanship assumed was impossible, but never believed it. That's why a year ago I offered a unity agenda to the nation as I stood here. We made real progress together. We passed the law making it easy for doctors to prescribe effective treatments for opioid addiction. We passed the gun safety law making historic investments in mental health. We launched the ARPA-H drive for breakthrough in the fights against cancer, Alzheimer's, and diabetes, and so much more. We passed 
The Heath Robinson Pact Act, named after the late Iraq War veteran whose story about exposure to toxic burn kits I shared here last year. I understand something about those burn pits, but there's so much more to do. We can do it together. Joining us tonight is a father named Doug from Newton, New Hampshire. He wrote Jill, my wife, a letter, and me as well, about his courageous daughter, Courtney. A contagious laugh, his sister's best friend, her sister's best friend. He shared a story all too familiar to millions of Americans and many of you in the audience. Courtney discovered pills in high school. It spiraled into addiction and eventually death from a fentanyl overdose. She was just 20 years old. Describing the last eight years without her, Doug said, there's no worse pain. Yet their family has turned pain to purpose, working to end the stigma and change laws. He told us he wants to start a journey toward American recovery. Doug, we're with you. Fentanyl is killing more than 70,000 Americans a year. Big, you got it. So let's launch a major surge to stop fentanyl production in the sale and trafficking with more drug detection machines, inspection cargo, stop pills and powder at the border. Working with couriers like FedEx to inspect more packages for drugs. Strong penalties to crack down on fentanyl trafficking. Second, let's do more on mental health, especially for our children. When millions of young people are struggling with bullying, violence, trauma, we owe them greater access to mental health care at their schools. We must finally hold social media companies accountable for experimenting or doing running children for profit. It's time to pass bipartisan legislation to stop big tech from collecting personal data on our kids and teenagers online, ban targeted advertising to children, and impose stricter limits on the personal data that companies collect on all of us. Third, let's do more to keep this nation's one truly sacred obligation to equip those we send into harm's way and care for them and their families when they come home. Job training, job placement for veterans and their spouses as they come to return to civilian life. Helping veterans afford the rent because no one should be homeless in America, especially someone who served the country. Dennis McDonough, Dennis McDonough is here at the VA. We had our first real discussion when I asked him to take the job. I'm glad he did. We were losing up to 25 veterans a day on suicide. Now we're losing 17 a day to the silent scourge of suicide. 17 veterans a day are committing suicide. More than all the people being killed in the wars. Folks, VA is doing everything it can, including expanding mental health screening, proven programs that recruit veterans to help other veterans understand what they're going through, get them the help they need. We got to do more. And fourth, last year, Jill and I reignited the cancer moonshot that I was able to start with President Obama asked me to lead our administration on this issue. Our goal is to cut the cancer death rates at least by 50% in the next 25 years. Turn more cancers from death sentences to treatable diseases. Provide more support for patients and their families. It's personal to so many of us, so many of us in this audience. Joining us are Morris and Candice, an Irishman and a daughter of immigrants from Panama. They met and fell in love in New York City and got married in the same chapel Jill and I got married in New York City kindred spirits. He wrote us a letter about his little daughter, Ava, and I saw her just before I came over. 
She was just a year old when she was diagnosed with rare kidney disease, cancer. After 26 blood transfusions, 11 rounds of radiation, eight rounds of chemo, one kidney removed, given a 5% survival rate. He wrote how, in the darkest moments, he thought, if she goes, I can't stay. Many of you have been through that as well. Jill and I understand that, like so many of you. And he read Jill's book describing our family's cancer journey and how we tried to steal moments of joy where we could with Bo. For them, that glimmer of joy was the half-smile of their baby girl. It meant everything to them. They never gave up hope. Little Ava never gave up hope. She turns four next month. They just found out Ava's beating the odds, is on her way to being cured of cancer. And she's watching from the White House tonight and she's not asleep already. For the lives we can save. For the lives we can save and the lives we've lost, let this be a truly American moment that rallies the country and the world together and proves that we can still do big things. 20 years ago, under the leadership of President Bush and countless advocates and champions, he undertook a bipartisan effort through PEPFAR to transform the global fight against HIV-AIDS. It's been a huge success. He thought big. He thought large. He moved. I believe we can do the same thing with cancer. Let's end cancer as we know it. Cure some cancers once and for all. Folks, there's one reason why we've been able to do all of these things. Our democracy itself. It's the most fundamental thing of all. With democracy, everything's possible. Without it, Nothing is. The last few years, our democracy has been threatened and attacked, put at risk, put to the test in this very room on January the 6th. And then just a few months ago, an unhinged big lie assailed and unleashed a political violence, the home of the then Speaker of the House of Representatives, using the very same language the insurrectionists used as they stalked these halls and chanted on January 6th. Here tonight in this chamber is a man who bears the scars of that brutal attack, but is as tough and as strong and as resilient as they get. My friend Paul Pelosi. Paul, stand up. <laughs> but such a heinous act should have never happened. We must all speak out. There's no place for political violence in America. We have to protect the right to vote, not suppress the fat fundamental right. Honor the results of our elections, not subvert the will of the people. We have to uphold the rule of law and restore trust in our institutions of democracy. And we must give hate and extremism in any form no safe harbor. <laughs> democracy must not be a partisan issue. It's an American issue. Every generation of Americans has faced a moment where they have been called to protect our democracy, defend it, stand up for it. And this is our moment. My fellow Americans, we meet tonight at an inflection point, one of those moments that only a few generations ever face, where the direction we now take is going to decide the course of this nation for decades to come. We're not bystanders of history. We're not powerless before the forces that confront us. It's within our power of we, the people. We're facing the test of our time. We have to be the nation we've always been at our best, optimistic, hopeful, forward-looking, a nation that embraces light over dark, hope over fear, unity over justice, stability over chaos. We have to see each other not as enemies, but as fellow Americans. We're good people. The only nation in the world built on an idea. The only one. Other nations.
nation are defined by geography, ethnicity. But we're the only nation based on an idea that all of us, every one of us, is created equal in the image of God, a nation that stands as a beacon of the world, a nation in a new age of possibilities. So I've come to fulfill my constitutional obligation to report in the State of the Union. And here's my, my, my report. Because the soul of this nation is strong, because the backbone, the backbone of this nation is strong, because the people of this nation are strong, the State of the Union is strong. I'm not new to this place. I stand here tonight, having served as long as about any one of you have ever served here. <laughs> but I've never been more optimistic about our future, about the future of America. We just have to remember who we are. We're the United States of America, and there's nothing, nothing beyond our capacity if we do it together. God bless you all, and may God protect our truth. Thank you. President Biden before the American people, before Congress tonight, a joint session, shaking Vice President Kamala Harris's hand there. Of course, just before that, shaking the hand of Speaker Kevin McCarthy, who he joked at the beginning, President Biden said, I don't want to ruin your reputation, but I look forward to working with you. Both the President and Speaker McCarthy, as we mentioned, have signaled uh, respect for one another as they face this looming uh, debt ceiling battle in Congress. That was part of this speech, and we'll get to that in a moment. But as we watch the president uh, prepare to leave the room, the shaking of the hands, the greeting members of Congress that we always expect after the State of the Union, uh, Mary Bruce, there, there were some interesting moments. We'll go through them all here, moments of bipartisan support, but also some uncomfortable moments uh, of, of some heckling there in the crowd. We saw Speaker McCarthy have to play the role of trying to quiet the chamber. But overall, as far as the president's concern, his performance tonight, what did you see in someone you cover every day? I see the president speak almost every day. We have not seen this Joe Biden in a while. Um, he, he brought it. He was energetic. He was in command. He was comfortable. For large sections of this speech, this was very relaxed. And look, he certainly is uh, sort of in his comfort zone on the Hill. But he, for naysayers who, who think that he isn't up for the job or isn't ready for another four years, should he make that decision, I think he, he showed them that he is up to the task. Uh, he was jovial, joking around. He poked Republicans. But in a really, you know, sort of soft way at times. He certainly showed he is quick on his feet when he really turned the tables on the debate about Social Security and Medicare. I know we will, we will get to that. But over and over again, it all underscored that this was a speech for the American people. This was not a speech about Washington. He was vintage Biden, joking around, quoting his dad, going back to that refrain constantly of trying to reach out to the American people, blue collar workers, arguing that he is doing the job that they hired him to do and that, you know, if he wanted to, trying to certainly seemed like a dress rehearsal for another run. We heard over and over again inside that chamber, Mary, tonight, finish the job. We knew that that would be uh, how he would frame this case he was making to the American people and to both uh, parties in that chamber. Rachel Scott is in the chamber tonight. and. Rachel, your observations in that room. Well, I can tell you right now, as Democrats are waiting to shake the president's hands, we are seeing Republicans quickly head for the exits. Uh, tense moments in the chamber tonight when the president insisted that Republicans wanted to cut Medicare and Social Security. Republicans wasted no time jumping to their feet. Several shouted no. Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene got up. She was among several Republicans who shouted liar. And then the, the president using it as an opportunity to put Republicans on the record. I can tell you that the full chamber, Democrats and Republicans, alike stood up when the president said that cuts to Medicare and Social Security should be off the table. And that is something that Speaker McCarthy has gone on the record about. He has insisted that those cuts indeed should be off the table. But there was other criticism uh, from Republicans tonight of the president. When the president brought up China, we heard another Republican shout, China spied on us. When the president brought up fentanyl deaths, we had another Repo Republican shout, it's your fault. Uh, but there were moments of unity.
unity tonight in the chamber, David, particularly when the president acknowledged the parents of Tyree Nichols, who was sitting in the first lady's box. We had Democrats and Republicans applaud, give them a standing ovation as he mentioned them by name. And I'm seated very close to where the mother of Tyree Nichols was seated. And at, she rose to her feet as the president called for action for some type of police reform. I heard her mouth the words, please, please, uh, urging Congress to get something done. But in a sign of the challenges ahead, Republicans remained seated during those calls, and they also remained seated when the president made that blanket call for more Democrats and Republicans to reach across the aisle and work together, David. Remarkable observation. Stay with us here, uh, Rachel, as we continue to cover this. The president uh, making his way uh, through the room, uh, working uh, through his foreign policy uh, establishment, the, the, the chair of the Joint Chiefs, just over his, uh, his shoulder there. But, Lindsay, we heard Rachel bring up the family of Tyree Nichols. That was a very moving moment. You heard, uh, you could hear a pin drop, basically, inside that chamber. The president said public safety depends on public trust. And we noticed uh, that not in the speech was something he, he appeared to ad lib there saying just as every officer who pins on the badge deserves to come home at night uh, so do children you know I'll leave it up to the pundits and historians as far as how he did tonight but I think the one place that he nailed it as it pertains to that particular discussion is the empathy you know at one point he was talking about I know how it feels when he was talking about struggling economically but then he started talking about the talk the conversation that to all too often black parents have to have uh, with their their children and he talked about how he never had to have the talk with his kids and he said but just imagine and you can imagine that uh, Rovon Wells the, the mother of Tyree she she only wants to hear two words. That's police reform. You know, he kept talking about the refrain, as you just said, let's finish the job. That's a job that he said would have been passed in uh, May of 2021. And so here we are almost two years later, and the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act still has stalled. And, and apparently uh, those conversations are going to pick back up. Um, but that as we just heard from Rachel Scott, we saw her imploring uh, the Republicans who were down on the floor standing and applauding applauding to do something to do something and walking that fine line of acknowledging the job facing law enforcement across this country uh, that good cops essentially yes. don't like bad cops too and saying we need to get them the training they need but again powerful as you point out do something we saw her from the chamber up above uh, the mother of Tyree Nichols looking down at Congress saying you can't let another one of these incidents go by without doing something and apparently Tim Scott and Cory Booker said that on the heels of the death of Tyree Nichols uh, that they have renewed talks. Uh, this is something that she said that, that her son uh, came here as on assignment from God and that she was hoping that something beautiful uh, would come out of his death. And, and this is that one something that she's hoping for. Yeah, said her son is a beautiful soul and something good will come from this. Uh, we will watch. She's watching and the nation's now watching after that moment. We are watching the president uh, greet retired justices from the Supreme Court a moment ago. Uh, that was something uh, new that we haven't seen in, in recent times, uh, John Carl. And uh, you heard Rachel Scott talk about that moment uh, on the floor. It was one of many. Uh, Speaker uh, McCarthy tested, if you will, about how well he could keep sort of a fractured Republican Party in the House. Uh, you know, sort of uh, their behavior was on full display tonight. We, and we saw some uncomfortable moments uh, when it came to fentanyl, uh, a couple of other moments as well. Uh, you, you heard Marjorie Taylor Greene yell, uh, liar, when it came to Medicare and Social Security. But then this was a very interesting scene we watched unfold. Uh, you know, fascinating because McCarthy earlier today publicly told his members, we have a code of ethics in the House, we have a way to behave, made it clear, respect for the president. He didn't want to see that display. And that display, you saw Marjorie Taylor Greene at times, and it wasn't just her. It was a pretty large group of Republicans acting, heckling the president of the United States during a State of the Union, not what McCarthy wanted to see. And from Biden himself, we've seen a hard-edged Biden at times talking about MAGA Republicans and dangerous extremists. That language was gone from this speech. He did poke the Republicans. He made some, you know, some, I mean, the stuff he said about Social Security was over the top. There's nobody seriously talking about sunsetting Social Security in the Republican Party. But he did it with a smile. It was a jovial Joe Biden, and he provoked that behavior 
uh, from the Republicans clearly making Kevin McCarthy uncomfortable. We do know that entitlements have been part of the discussion long term, yeah. though, about yeah. where uh, the country can potentially save money. Democrats say that's a, a non-starter. I, I do want to bring and in... so is McCarthy. I mean, McCarthy said, look, no cuts to Social Security or Medicare, and so is McConnell. But to go from booze to the entire chamber standing, John, amazing, you acknowledge, an amazing right? moment, well, Democrats yes. and Republicans, <laughs> he said, apparently, we all agree on this then. Yeah. Uh, and, and moments later, they were all uh, on their feet saying, we will not touch Social Security uh, and Medicare. That will be a moment, I think, that we go yes. back to uh, perhaps in the future along uh, the road with this debate. I want to bring in uh, Donna Brazil and Chris Christie. They always grade the performance of uh, the president after a State of the Union, regardless of which administration. Donna Brazil, to you first, and on that moment where he got Democrats and Republicans to pledge uh, that they wouldn't touch Social Security and Medicare. What do you make of that? I thought it was a master class, a master class in politics, but m more importantly, a master class in how you can get your opponents to stand up and agree with you right there in real time. Uh, but look, I thought Joe Biden was incredible tonight, not only in what he said, but how he said it and the tone that he used. He was really talking to those so-called invisible Americans, Americans who want to be seen and heard. So tonight they heard, I think a president says, I'm bringing gas prices down. I'm bringing down the price of eggs, but we got to finish the job. So he had a plea at the, at the end, but I thought overall, I give him high marks. And Donna, you know a lot of people throughout this country are, are questioning at home whether or not uh, President Biden is going to run for a second term. It is part of the conversation uh, in this country. Given what you saw tonight, uh, the energy that he brought to this address, what do you make of the potential that he will declare that he's going to run for a second term? Well, as you well know, the next presidential election is more than 637 days away. So we have a little bit of time. But I do believe that President Biden will seek re-election. He has a great record. He knows that there's more to do, but tonight he showed us the receipts. So I hope that we'll hear from him later this year on his plans for the future. But as one Democrat, and only one, there are millions others, I think he, he deserve another run for it. Donna Brazil, as always, we appreciate it. Chris Christie, former governor of New Jersey, ABC News analyst. Chris, what did you make of what you heard tonight? Well, uh, two observations from me, David. The first is that um, any uh, allusion any longer to Joe Biden being a moderate is now over. Um, if you listen to this laundry list of giveaways that he uh, announced throughout this address tonight, it, you know, he's telling the American public, basically, turn over most of your money to us. We know how to spend it better than you do. Um, and so, and I'm going to give you this and give you that and give you that. Let me tell everybody out there, nobody gives anybody anything. It's got to be paid for, either by increasing deficits, higher taxes, or both. And I was struck by what all the things he wants to give away to people um, to promise them. Let me tell you, that's definitely a politician running for re-election. And secondly, I thought there was a moment of incredible hypocrisy when the president talked about pounded on the pharmaceutical industry. It was pounded and pounded on the pharmaceutical industry. And then immediately after that, talked about how we survived the COVID pandemic because of the innovation that brought us vaccines. Well, where the heck does he think that innovation came from? It came from billions of dollars in private investment made by the Pfizer Corporation in the development of that technology over the course of decades that was being able to be brought to bear to be able to slow down the death rate, the death toll, and the hospitalization toll that was going on in this country because of the COVID-19 virus. Yet, he wants to take that money away from them to pay for you know, his laundry list of giveaways in social programs. And he wants to criticize the pharmaceutical industry, which are the people, not the government, those industries develop the technology to be able to cure COVID-19. I thought that was a breathtaking moment of hypocrisy um, and, and one that I think will be discussed a lot in the in the days and weeks going forward. Governor Christie, though, you think it's very clear he's running again from what you saw tonight? Oh, there's no doubt about it. Look, any politician who's giving away everything, he was essentially emptying his pockets, my pockets and your pockets, David, to give away everything he possibly could to the people who he's going to be hoping will vote for him in uh, in less than two years. That's a guy who is running for reelection. Uh, there's no question in my mind about it. 
Uh, he wants to stay for another four years beyond the four he's been given. And he is already setting the tone. This was the warm up for the announcement that he's running for re-election. Perhaps that's the one point I can get you and Donna to agree on. See, I work for consensus here, <laughs> at least on, on one point. Chris and Donna, we thank you as always as President Biden continues uh, to work the room inside this chamber. I want to go back to Rachel Scott tonight because uh, Mary uh, was talking earlier about the level of energy President Biden brought uh, to the speech here in the chamber. Uh, there were bipartisan moments. We're looking right now at Vice President Kamala Harris, uh, uh, second gentleman Doug Emhoff there, uh, also with Speaker McCarthy. Speaker McCarthy, Rachel at times, uh, tested himself up there in this new role, uh, given the fact that he wanted a unified Republican Party in that chamber. Exactly, David. And this is just the reality that Speaker Kevin McCarthy is faced with. He is not only faced with a very thin, a very narrow Republican majority in the House, he's also faced with different factions of the Republican Party. And he wanted tonight to remain civil. He wanted members of his conference to remain respectful to the President of the United States. I was told by sources in a closed door meeting earlier. He urged his party to continue to remain cordial as the president gave this address tonight. But as we saw this play out here in the chamber, there were certain moments where things did take a turn, where you had Republicans uh, calling the president of the United States a liar on certain issues, where they got up and pointed fingers uh, at the president before then sitting down. And, and this just underscores the immense amount of uh, challenges ahead for Speaker McCarthy uh, when it comes to unifying his own party, David. I want to bring in Terry Moran, who's watching along with us here. You, you heard the president tonight uh, talk about unemployment, obviously, that 3.4% unemployment rate in the last couple of days that came out. That's the lowest in 69, 800,000 manufacturing jobs, uh, more than 10 million jobs in, since uh, he began uh, his term. Uh, but, Terry, there was an acknowledgment of the people that he called uh, invisible. That's a word we've heard from previous administrations, but it was an acknowledgement that there are many Americans who simply don't feel uh, these numbers, the, 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 these apparent positive numbers. We know we're still dealing with inflation. It's eased somewhat, but the, the numbers that President Biden pointing to tonight, uh, there did seem to be acknowledgement on his part that not everyone is enjoying these numbers. Absolutely, and our ABC News Washington Post poll that found that 41%, four out of every 10 Americans, told us that they are more, they are worse off financially uh, than they were when Joe Biden became president. That's a tough number for any president. And so, you know, what, what Chris Christie calls a, a laundry list in, in some ways is old-fashioned, tub-thumping, democratic, populist politics. Uh, that is a list of things that people want. Help with child care, help with pre prescription drugs, even the junk fees uh, that, that you're charged when you change cable companies or when you go to a hotel. You know, he goes after that, too. That's the, that was definitely, it seemed to me, uh, aimed at a re-election, making people happy. But in general, I think this speech was aimed at, at the, the America that wasn't just forgotten during this pandemic or recession, but that's been forgotten on 40 years of economic policy in the United States. He said for decades the middle class uh, has been forgotten, and he wants to re return jobs to that group of Americans. He said several times, as he has across the country, that he wants jobs that don't require a college degree. It's an old-fashioned sense uh, of what the American dream is. You can be a middle-class person, you can get a good job, pay the mortgage, put food on the table, maybe get a cabin up north or something, have a decent life uh, without depending, with, and in your hometown, without having to move, without having to depend on the forces of globalization, that America will take care of its own. There's a national industrial policy that he outlined tonight, very ambitious, and it's no question it's what he would run on should he choose. Mary Bruce, you cover this administration day in and day out. This looks like a president who's enjoying himself here tonight. <laughs> he, he talked about the bipartisan infrastructure, as Terry alluded uh, to there. He said that many Republicans supported it, and even the ones who didn't, who are now asking me for money in their districts, <laughs> I will show up, I will be there for the groundbreaking. Yeah, uh, not so subtle dig there at the Republicans who didn't support the bill. Um, yeah, first of all, this is Joe Biden enjoying himself. This may be the part that he likes the most about a State of the Union, is just working the room right here. Um, but he was making a sales pitch throughout this entire speech, right, trying to convince the American people that his policies are working and that if they just stick with him, they will start to feel the impact, that those poll numbers will change, those four in 10 Americans who feel that they are worse off now than when he started. He's asking them to trust him and say, stick with me and you will feel a positive impact of that. That's a tall order. 
in a speech to convince people. It's a huge audience, possibly his biggest of the year, but that's the goal here. Uh, and he can try and sell it, but will it resonate finally? That's the big question. And Martha Reddits, that's the challenge. You've traveled this country. It's whether or not he could be optimistic, but also at the same time connect with Americans who say, we're waiting here, Mr. President. And, and you've talked to a lot of people across the country. I certainly have, and, and I'll go back to the midterms. All they talked about was the economy and how that would affect them and those gas prices. And indeed, Joe Biden is trying to appeal to all of them. Just wait and see. We'll get through this. We'll get through this. Or if you listen to Chris Christie, he was giving them everything they want. But that does resonate. That is what they want to hear. They do want to hear that things will get better. And if there's one area where he might get the majority of Americans, it, it might be taking on the pharmaceutical companies. So that might have been one safe point. <laughs> I, I, I mean, look, you might, uh, Governor Christie may be right about the hypocrisy of those two points, but I mean, it's not unpopular to go against pharmaceutical companies for high-priced prescription drugs. By the way, this is, the, this is different than the last two State of the Unions because we're at a packed chamber. I nope. mean, this is... This is not a COVID reduced audience state of the union and he is loving that. Not only that, everyone is here, but they were allowed to bring guests for the first time yeah. in several years. This is a, a different moment this America is, a, is witnessing and tonight. And he's first as president to see this. Um, but I gotta say, David, the, the shouting and the liar and the pointing, it just tells you how far we have come. You remember in 2009 when Joe Wilson, a congressman from South Carolina, stood up at a joint session Barack Obama speech and said, you're a liar. And it, he, got, he got censured, uh, there was a widespread outcry. And here you had how many members of Congress yeah. doing much more than that? Well, it was a startling moment la back then, and, and you'd have to... And it was a single person saying one line. And you'd have to be concerned if it's considered the norm now. Yeah. All right, well, when we come back here, the president has just left the chamber. Someone, John, you will know well, Mary as well, in the White House briefing room. A new role, Arkansas Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders, newly elected. She will deliver the Republican response here in just a moment, and we'll have the roundtable to weigh in on how she performs as well. Don't go away. Right back. Coming up, she is a rising star in the Republican Party, the former White House press secretary and now governor of Arkansas. Sarah Huckabee Sanders delivers the Republican response next on ABC. Oh, what a good time we will have. Once again, good days will come. Taryn, the joy of movement. I got you, baby. Dogs help us live longer. Return the favor with Fresh Pet. Fresh, wholesome meats and veggies for the long haul. Fresh Pet. My most important kitchen tool, my brain. So I choose Nariva Plus. Unlike some others, Nareva Plus is a multitasker supporting six key indicators of brain health to help keep me sharp. Nareva, think bigger. There's nothing like hitting the waves. There's nothing like volunteering, but my moderate to severe eczema can make it hard. Now I'm staying ahead of it. Dupixit helps heal your skin from within, so you can have clearer skin and noticeably less itch. Serious allergic reactions can occur that can be severe. Tell your doctor about new or worsening eye problems such as eye pain or vision changes, including blurred vision, joint aches and pain, or a parasitic infection. Don't change or stop asthma medicines without talking to your doctor. Ask your doctor about to fix it. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. What are you going to put me on? The deadbeat. Oh, my God, you're putting me on obituaries? <laughs> Don't you come any closer, I will kill you. I'm already dead. Fun fact, you're the only one that can see me. No! Yep. No! You ready? Come on, let's go. 
it's not the most current dance, but I do it really well. First time I've been in a place that I love doing something that I love. With people that you love? No, I didn't say that. Janine. Gregory? Uh, Ava? Ava's here. Sorry, I don't speak line. Yo. Stop the press. The parent test has everyone questioning. I would never tolerate that. The best parenting styles. We'd be ignorant to not acknowledge that there are crazy amounts of dangers in the world. It could be difficult, but it's important to have these conversations. We all want to keep our kids safe, but we can't be with them every second. She just had puppies. They're right around the corner. You want to go see puppies? The Parent Test, new Thursday on ABC. The State of the Union and the Republican response. Here again, David Muir. Welcome back to ABC News live coverage here in Washington. President Biden completing his second State of the Union address to the nation. And now, as is tradition, the Republican response tonight and a name you will know. Arkansas Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders will now deliver the Republican response, best known, of course, to much of the country as former President Trump's White House press secretary for quite some time. She is now the nation's youngest governor. Her father was once governor of that state, so making history as well, and a rising star in her party. Quick thought from you, John Carl. You sat in that briefing room often with Absolutely. her. Absolutely, and not chosen because she was Trump's spokesperson, but chosen because she is the youngest governor in America and the first woman to be governor of Arkansas. But of course, that was a very high profile role the most high profile uh, press secretary, longest serving in terms of the public appearances she made in that briefing room. Uh, but again, now she is Sarah Sanders, governor. That's right. Not spokesperson for Donald Trump. Youngest woman governor in the country and a mother as well. Let's listen to Governor Sanders from Little Rock, Arkansas hey, hey. tonight. I'm Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Being a mom to three young children taught me not to believe every story I hear. So forgive me for not believing much of anything I heard tonight from President Biden. From out of control inflation and violent crime to the dangerous border crisis and threat from China, Biden and the Democrats have failed you. They know it and you know it. And it's time for a change. Tonight, let us reaffirm our commitment to a timeless American idea that government exists not to rule the people but to serve the people. Democrats want to rule us with more government control, but that's not who we are. America is the greatest country the world has ever known because we're the freest country the world has ever known with a people who are strong and resilient. Five months ago, I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. It was a hard time for our family, particularly our kids, Scarlett, Huck and George, but we kept our faith and persevered. Thanks to exceptional doctors here in Arkansas, a successful surgery and the grace of God, I am cancer free. Through it all, I couldn't help but think about my mom. She was 20 years old and in her first year of marriage when she was diagnosed with spinal cancer. The doctors told her she might not live and if she did live, they said she'd never walk again. And if she did walk, she'd definitely never have children. The daughter she was told she'd never have was just sworn in as the new governor of Arkansas and is speaking to you tonight. Adversity and fear of the unknown can paralyze us, but faith propels us to charge boldly ahead. We can't stand still in the face of great challenges. You and I were put on this earth for such a time as this, to charge boldly ahead. I'll be the first to admit, President Biden and I don't have a lot in common. I'm for freedom, he's for government control. At 40, I'm the youngest governor in the country. And at 80, he's the oldest president in American history. I'm the first woman to lead my state, and he's the first man to surrender his presidency to a woke mob that can't even tell you what a woman is. In the radical left's America, 
Washington taxes you and lights your hard-earned money on fire. But you get crushed with high gas prices, empty grocery shelves, and our children are taught to hate one another on account of their race, but not to love one another or our great country. Whether Joe Biden believes this madness or is simply too weak to resist it, his administration has been completely hijacked by the radical left. The dividing line in America is no longer between right or left. The choice is between normal or crazy. It's time for a new generation of Republican leadership. Upon taking office just a few weeks ago, I signed executive orders to ban CRT, racism, and indoctrination in our schools. Eliminate the use of derogatory term Latinx in our government repealed COVID orders and said never again to authoritarian mandates and shutdowns. Americans want common sense from their leaders, but in Washington, the Biden administration is doubling down on crazy. President Biden inherited the fastest economic recovery on record, the most secure border in history, cheap, abundant, homegrown energy, fast rising wages, a rebuilt military, and a world that was stable and at peace. But over the last two years, Democrats destroyed it all. Despite Democrats' trillions in reckless spending and mountains of debt, we now have the worst border crisis in American history. As a mom, my heart breaks for every parent who has lost a son or daughter to addiction. 100,000 Americans a year are now killed from drug overdoses, largely from fentanyl pouring across our southern border. Yet the Biden administration refuses to secure the border and save American lives. And after years of Democrat attacks on law enforcement and calls to defund the police, violent criminals roam free while law-abiding families live in fear. Beyond our border from Afghanistan to Ukraine, from North Korea to Iran, President Biden's weakness puts our nation and the world at risk. And the president's refusal to stand up to China, our most formidable adversary, is dangerous and unacceptable. President Biden is unwilling to defend our border, defend our skies, and defend our people. He is simply unfit to serve as commander in chief. And while you reap the consequences of their failures, the Biden administration seems more interested in woke fantasies than the hard reality Americans face every day. Most Americans simply wanna live their lives in freedom and peace. But we are under attack in a left-wing culture war we didn't start and never wanted to fight. Every day, we are told we must partake in their rituals, salute their flags, and worship their false idols, all while big government colludes with big tech to strip away the most American thing there is, your freedom of speech. That's not normal. It's crazy, and it's wrong. Make no mistake, Republicans will not surrender this fight. We will lead with courage and do what's right not what's politically correct or convenient. Republicans believe in an America where strong families thrive in safe communities, where jobs are abundant and paychecks are rising, where the freedom our veterans shed their blood to defend is the birthright of every man, woman, and child. These are the principles Republican governors are fighting for, and in Washington, under the leadership of Senate Republicans and Speaker Kevin McCarthy, we will hold the Biden administration accountable. Down the street from where I sit is my alma mater, Little Rock Central High. As a student there, I will never forget watching my dad, Governor Mike Huckabee, and President Bill Clinton hold the doors open to the Little Rock Nine doors that 40 years earlier had been closed to them because they were black. Today, those children once barred from the schoolhouse 
are now heroes memorialized in bronze at our state house. I'm proud of the progress our country has made. And I believe giving every child access to a quality education, regardless of their race or income, is the civil rights issue of our day. Tomorrow, I will unveil an education package that will be the most far-reaching, bold, conservative education reform in the country. My plan empowers parents with real choices, improves literacy and career readiness, and helps put a good teacher in every classroom by increasing their starting salary from one of the lowest to one of the highest in the nation. Here in Arkansas and across America, Republicans are working to end the policy of trapping kids in failing schools and sentencing them to a lifetime of poverty. We will educate, not indoctrinate our kids, and put students on a path to success. It's time for a new generation to lead. This is our moment. This is our opportunity. A new generation born in the waning decades of the last century, shaped by economic booms and stock market busts, forged by the triumph of the Cold War and the tragedy of 9-11. A generation brimming with passion and new ideas to solve age-old problems. A generation moored to our deepest values and oldest traditions, yet unafraid to challenge the present order and find a better way forward. If we seize this moment together, America can once again be the land of the free and the home of the brave. During my two and a half years at the White House, I traveled on every foreign trip with the president. A trip I will never forget was on December 25th of 2018. My husband Brian and I had just cleaned up wrapping paper that was shoved into every corner of our house, thanks to our three kids. When I had to walk out on my own family's Christmas, unable to tell them where I was going that night, because the place I'd be traveling was so dangerous, they didn't want anybody to know that the president was going to be on the ground, even for a few hours. We boarded Air Force One in complete and total darkness. There were no lights on the plane, no lights on the runway. Our phones and computers shut down and turned in. We were going completely off the grid. Nearly 12 hours later, in the pitch black of night, we landed in the war-torn part of Western Iraq. It was again a similar scene. No lights on the plane, no lights on the runway. The only thing you could see was coming from about a mile away in a dining hall where hundreds of troops who were in the fight against ISIS had gathered expecting to celebrate Christmas with senior military leadership from around the region. They had absolutely no idea that the President and First Lady were about to walk into that room. And when they did, it was a sight and a scene and a sound I hope I never forget. The room erupted. Men and women from every race, religion, and region, every political party, every demographic you can imagine started chanting in perfect unison over and over and over again, USA, USA, USA. It was an absolutely perfect picture of what makes our country great. One of the young soldiers yelled from the back, Mr. President, I re-enlisted in the military because of you. And the president said, and son, I'm here because of you. Shortly after that young soldier came up to me, he said, Sarah, you have a tough job. I told him what I do is nothing. You take bombs and bullets, that's a tough job. And in a moment that I know I'll cherish for the rest of my life, 
That soldier reached up and he pulled the Brave Rifles patch he wore on his shoulder and he placed it into my hand, a sign of ultimate respect. And he said, Sarah, we are in this together. Overwhelmed with emotion and speechless, I just hugged him with tears in my eyes and a grateful heart for our heroes who keep us free. That young man and everyone who has served before him, all of those who serve alongside him, and the thousands we know who will be called upon to serve after him, deserve to know they have a country and a community back home doing our part in the fight for freedom. America is great because we are free, but today our freedom is under attack and the America we love is in danger. President Biden and the Democrats have failed you and it's time for a change. A new generation of Republican leaders are stepping up, not to be caretakers of the status quo, but to be change makers for the American people. We know not what the future holds, but we know who holds the future in his hands. And with God as our witness, we will show the world that America is still the place where freedom reigns and liberty will never die. Thank you. God bless you. And God bless America. And there you have it. Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders live from Little Rock with the Republican response tonight, making the case a couple of different ways that it is time for a new generation of Republican leadership. Uh, it's making some news on social media, given the fact that she worked with the previous administration, the previous Republican President Donald Trump. You know her from the White House briefing room, but she is now the youngest governor in the nation. Uh, having uh, now earned uh, that role once held by her father uh, in Arkansas, the new governor of Arkansas. There is some news coming out of the House chamber. Rachel Scott is now outside the Capitol. She's live at her post, not inside the chamber. Uh, and, and Rachel, we're learning more about uh, Senator Mitt Romney and an exchange with uh, Congressman George Santos, of course, just to bring the audience up to speed here. And they probably don't need it, knowing our audience. They're so read in. But George Santos is the New York congressman who uh, apparently made up much of his life story to get elected and Mitt Romney had some choice words for him tonight. Oh, he did, David. He told him that he was an embarrassment straight to his face when Santos positioned himself along the aisle, the place where he would normally interact with the president and other members of Congress coming in. Uh, Senator Mitt Romney told reporters afterwards that he was surprised to see Santos there, given the multiple investigations that he's facing, that he needs to be in the back row and be quiet, not parading in front of the president of the United States, David. Yeah, somewhat extraordinary uh, in nature that moment as it played out with uh, Senator Mitt Romney and George Santos right there on the aisle where the president makes the entrance for the state of the union. Rachel, uh, thank you for your excellent coverage all night long. I'll give Mary Bruce, our senior White House correspondent, uh, the last word here because you're hearing from your sources over at the White House. What, what did they make of the president's performance tonight? I think the White House is very happy with the way the president performed tonight. Some suggesting this may be one of his strongest and best speeches. The president, as he left the chamber, actually telling reporters with a smile, he thought it was a nice reception. All right. Mary Bruce, John Carl, Martha Raddatz, Lindsay Davis, incredible team here in the studio with me tonight. Our coverage continues with Lindsay on ABC News Live and, of course, your late local news. The teams are standing by right now at a little later Nightline. Remember, Good Morning America, first thing in the morning, Vice President Kamala Harris for an interview tomorrow morning on GMA. And I'm David Muir. I'll see you for World News tonight, tomorrow night. Good night, everyone.